confident to you guys. So we've been working um, as a, obviously as a publisher, and we've been thinking how can a publisher enter the preprint space in a way that is really meaningful. And so when we look at all of the existing um, preprint uh, uh, servers that are out there, certainly in our space, there's a lot of biomedical, but then obviously the ones that came before journals like Archive and SSRN, they're the only ones with any really meaningful numbers, if you think about it. Um, because even BioArchive in our space, in my space, um, is at 20, you know, after four years, um, is only looking at 11,000 preprints total. And we're talking about a space in the biomedical that is at least a million for published articles and probably 1.5 to 2 million for articles that go through multiple rounds of revision. So we've also been seeing um, the rise um, of ASAP Bio, of uh, funders now supporting preprints um, all around. And so, you know, these are uh, slightly um, older, but there's a huge disruptive potential of preprints. Um, in how they can decouple the publication of research from the value, the evaluation of its, of its importance or impact. And that's really been something that's been very high on PLOS's agenda, is that you know, we really want to uh, have the paper stand on its own. It's not about journal impact factors. It's not about all of these age-old incentives um, that are out there. And as we watch the funders turn the corner on saying a preprint is a valid form of work product, that's what we want to uh, be a part of. We want to make sure that we're facilitating that uh, with our, our publishers as well, I mean our authors as well. So from uh, the standpoint of preprints, we have been a longtime supporter. We have been parts of policy and articles and um, RFAs and uh, with NIH in order to support the rise of preprints. But still, the numbers are middling you know, at best. Um, I think I saw a slide just last week that said that of all the content, only 1%, 1% in the biomedical world is making it into a preprint space. So um, we have done partnerships with BioArchive in order to try to help boost this. We have uh, used our own editors to go in and try to uh, see which preprints may make good papers. We are definitely active in um, this space. So we think about what role can a publisher play, especially a publisher like PLOS, who's really, really um, interested in what it means to, um, to change scientific communication and the time to publication. So the time to publication right now is crazy. I mean, I think that we all know this, the poor authors will go through one, two, sometimes three rounds of uh, publishing uh, review where they will have to, you know, take their paper and they could take their rejection and they have to reformat it and over and over and over again, this kind of time adds to what is um, uh, stalling the scientific progress out there. So I want to actually show you this slide. Because um, this kind of is is a slide that sort of speaks a thousand words. So just before I go here, do any questions so far? I tend to speak very fast. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Um, so from a from what we're, we're we're thinking about is that the the publishing model is in fact very very um, uh, accepting of the inputs. You know, we do all the publishing. As a publisher, we do all the work necessary already in order to create a valid preprint display, in order to create a responsible preprint. And so as a publisher, as an organization like PLOS, we have been building technological components all along the way that we are now working to um, uh, connect in order to create a whole new paradigm around scalable preprints. And so I'm gonna to try to run through this and please feel free to try to interrupt me and ask me questions. Um, so the idea here is that as a publisher of seven journals and, a, and you know, still the largest mega journal out there, um, we care a great deal about the fact that our existing peer review process needs to continue to work. <laughs> and so we're not trying to remove that, dismantle it, or um, dismiss it as second, second class. However, 
all of our experience with the existing preprint servers is that it is in fact asking these very, very busy authors to do yet one more thing. It is one more step that they have to do in order to get their paper disseminated and communicated in a publishing sphere. So what we want to do is we want to take our submission system, which is a new submission system we have developed called Aperto, and we are going to uh, set up a standard submission interface. And it's something we're working on now. It's a standard submission interface that um, is something that any author could submit any kind of content. So it's agnostic to biomedical or physics or earth science. Um, and they can submit any kind of content and it can then run through a workflow process. And that workflow may mean that after that author has done their submission, it gets transferred to an existing manuscript system for peer review. But it also means that by creating that new standard, especially for our journals, because we had get so many submissions, is that we can offer them at that point the suggestion that they go to a preprint. And the other thing that we have um, huge amounts of experience doing that very few have, it's the idea of being able to do a reasonable number of checks on the content in a very short period of time. So, you know, we look at BioArchive, which is, you know, obviously in our space, but in terms of BioArchive, they are um, using 60 academics in order to review, you know, a few hundred articles a month. We get a couple hundred articles a day. <laughs> and so that's not going to work for us. And so those couple of hundred articles a day that we receive, they go through a reasonable number of checks within a week already. That is our standard operating procedure here. So we're thinking, well, we have all this information about what we've published. So we've published 175,000 articles. We also have everything of what we rejected. So how can we automate this? How can we set up this new, inter this new um, standard for screening that takes in this, uh, we're, we're developing an AI technology that takes all that learning for our you know, 14 years of experience and says that you know, this new paper that's coming in is likely okay. So we have sort of a red, amber, green, like a stoplight um, uh, a perspective on this, where if it's largely green, then maybe it doesn't need to get checked. It doesn't need to have any eyeballs on it. But if it has, you know, if it goes into the yellow bucket because it talks about vaccines or it talks about um, uh, climate change, or it talks about something that could be controversial, then maybe somebody should take a quick look at that to make sure we don't, you know, run into another paper, you know, published by The Lancet and get into a lot of trouble. Um, and then, and then there's the red bucket where, you know, something is clearly not science. You know, it talks about creationism or it talks about something else that is clearly not science. And then, so that screening component is something that could be used and um, tuned by other organizations, for example, in the earth sciences. Because while we have, you know, PLOS One has a huge breadth of content, it is not, you know, as strong in all areas. It's very strong in the biomedical space. Um, does it have a lot of physics? Oh, a little bit, a little chemistry. Um, a little mathematics, a little uh, statistics, but you know, for the most part, we it, it is it is you know tipped in in one way. So we are looking to work with partners and organizations that have a um, a invested interest in seeing that kind of technology or that kind of screening uh, enabled for their particular field, and you know that may mean that you know we throw more content at it, you know, the accepted papers as well as the um, as well as the rejected papers in order to tune the system again. And to be fair, and this is I want to be really clear here, we don't think that the um, the amount of screening or checking necessary for a preprint rivals what is done for peer review. Peer review is in fact its own thing and it should remain its own thing. Um, but the, the idea that it could represent a responsible posting and for fast dissemination of content 
to us is extremely interesting for an organization that cares so much about changing the paradigm of research communication, of scientific communication and dissemination. That to us is the biggest thing. If you can change the time frame from when an author submits to the time that they're actually online, then as a preprint from you know uh, seven days, let's say for a responsible preprint that also has gone through a plagiarism check. It's also gone through um, you know a uh, maybe an ethical check or a conflict of interest check um, that it can and then still be considered as part of a journal as uh, for journal consideration and peer review. Then it's it's basically taking a lot of the best worlds. But what we're finding is that. The submission part of it is the key to the kingdom in many ways, because when they submit full text, when they submit data, when they submit, you know, all of this information, their figures and their supplementary data as part of a standard submission. And we make that easy because right now we're running at about 10 minutes versus a couple of hours to do a submission. Um, that that is going to change what is the output. It changes how we can screen things. It changes how we can transfer that same article from publisher to publisher and give the author the experience of not having to do a walk of shame from publisher to publisher, but instead that they can actually say, oh, okay, well, you know, in my case, PLOS has rejected me, um, send it off to nature now. And that transfer protocol can happen very seamlessly. And so we're working with um, all the major manuscript systems in order to um, facilitate a standard transfer protocol and package that can move from publisher to publisher. So that the essentially the whole ecosystem for how we exist, we as a publisher exist in uh, disseminating content could change significantly. And we're not stuck inside the box that says, okay, you have to do peer review and you have to do it this way and you have to do it that way. It actually frees us to think of another target. And so preprints is just an idea right now as one of those targets. Think about posters, think about conference proceedings, think about you know um, just data sets with a little bit of metadata. All of this becomes possible with the right infrastructure, with the right platform. And so we're, we've moved from business models and uh, sustainable business models and changing you know, research assessment in terms of uh, sound science and certainly on scalable, sustainable um, business models around open access to talking about open platforms, to talking about open source, to talking about how our platform could really change what other organizations can do because we see the Elseviers of this world getting geared up in the services world. We see Wiley buying out upon. We see all of that. And that gives me pause, I have to say, that from a technological standpoint, you're going to see the tail wagging the dog. And all of a sudden, the dog, which is all this content, all this important research that's supposed to be disseminated, is going to be um, somehow part of an Elsevier machine, or it's going to be part of a Springer Nature machine. And, you know, PLOS is in a position because of our mindset to um, make a difference here in a not for profit way, in a way that is non threatening, that is agnostic, and that is meant to, you know, lead by example as to what could be done in the preprint space to take what are right now middling numbers and say, OK, well, if a publisher with 60,000 submissions can say get even 50 percent of them or even 20 percent of them published in a year, that already eclipses everything that's already been done. In, in you know, for so far in the biomedical sciences, that to me is an interesting conversation. And so I just want that's essentially what PLOS is preparing to do now. That sounds uh, it sounds useful and uh, uh, and it sounds you know like a good 
a good counterpoint to a lot of the stuff that, like you said, has been going on. Um, Hi, this is Matt. Uh, just a quick question, then I'll have to uh, go. Is um, um, do you have a feel for why, um, say, just in the biomed field, there's such a low percentage of preprints? So I think there's a lot of different reasons. The incentives until recently haven't been there. It's actually been stated by some of the leading journals that if you publish a preprint, we won't consider your paper. Mm -hmm. So while the incentives are still to be published in a high impact journal, that that will lead most researchers, other than Nobel Prize winners, <laughs> who have already you know established their careers, um, to basically back off. Now that that's changing, so the NIH biosketch has changed. Uh, now that you know the, the brief set of slides that I showed, where you know the funders are getting behind this, organizations are getting behind this, institutions are getting behind the idea of preprints as valid work product, then that is where we see the the shift happening. But that's only really happened in the last six months, yeah. so it's still fairly new. Whereas in the case of physics, they started before journals even existed online. Mm -hmm. Physics came on board in 1991. First journals went online in 1994. So um, they didn't have this kind of tension. We have this natural tension now because we have a lot of publishers out there with a vested interest in not seeing this content go out early. They actually yeah. want to control that, that conversation. Yeah, and, and your sciences are interesting, I think, because I think it might not even be either of those. And it's, it, it's probably, I think it's more just people haven't thought about doing it. Um, and uh, there, because there's there's much less commercial interest. I mean, some geophysics domains have commercial interests, like oil and, and so on. But um, in, in many of them, there's not a whole lot. Um, so you know, in terms of getting things out, you are not worrying about that. But I don't know that many publishers have necessarily put out those statements either. So I think it's sort of somewhere in between. It's just the community hasn't been doing it. There hasn't been a preprint culture like there was in physics, and so it just hasn't kind of got off the ground. Agree. Yeah. Great. Well, I do need to head out. Uh, thanks a lot. It's really interesting. Great talking to you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye, Matt. Bye, Matt. And, uh, Luis, you had mentioned in the um, the workflow the kind of stoplight approach. Was it, it sounds great. I mean, it just things look okay. Am I, you know, why spend the time and just you know pass them right through? Um, but I was kind of curious about the the other side of that. If, if something does get flagged as um, potentially needing review. It is is that a service that PLOS provides, or are you kind of um, handing that back to people within the domain? I, I wasn't sure how that, that workflow played out. So we can do both. Uh, we've been, you know, because this is still kind of early days for us, we're still sort of feeling out what um, certain organizations may want. So in the case of another organization that we've been talking to, they have the domain expertise, and they would actually prefer that they're part of that screening process. They would like their people um, to, you know, get get um, access to the system to be able to review, you know, uh, the papers that are are flagged. Whereas others say, you know, we don't we don't have that yet. Maybe you could do that for us. Um, and depending on the field, we have the people. I mean, we have six thousand, you know, editorial board members. Um, around the world. So we have a lot of domain experience, but like I said, there are gaps and there, or there are areas where we're less strong. And so, um, you know, we can, depending on the field, we would work with uh, that organization on what they needed. Yeah. Okay. And, and when a, a paper does go to a preprint service um, you know, for, for storage and promotion, is there a particular implementation or is that open as well? And it, you know, via you know API it could be sent to any open infrastructure it could be sent to any open infrastructure we have talked about this with most of the preprint servers that are out there because this you know what what I showed you is a little bit under the road you know it, it doesn't it doesn't matter what buildings on top it's this is more about the plumbing and the electrical than it is about the actual display of the preprint um, we do care about that though a lot because we do display right now for our own content 
Um, and But at the end of the day, it's a garbage in, garbage out problem. That if you accept too little information or you make it too onerous for the, um, the author, then you know you're you're gonna get what you you're gonna get out of it what you put into it. And so we're trying to find that happy medium of you know that 10 minute, maybe 30 minute for the author in terms of submitting their content, but it's big enough and it's good enough that we can take it to full text, we can expand the images, we can deal with videos, we could, you know, all these kinds of things that augment the the research in a way that is really um, useful to the author, or to, I mean, to the reader too. So, right. Okay. And I think, I mean, we are certainly very interested in, in pursuing preprints, but I feel like we're still, um, you know, at the very early stages in discussing what this would look like in, you know, in the art sciences. Do, do you have any suggestions or recommendations of, um, you know, if we wanted to proceed with PLOS, what, how we might go about it or what the ne next steps might be? Well, tell me a little bit more about, I mean, I know you sent me the the, um, the email, but tell me a bit more about, you know, how you foresee preprints fitting in with your current work. I mean, how what, what is your vision of that? I, I feel like the earth sciences doesn't really have any infrastructure um, in that area at the moment. And I feel like um, we're starting to see some of the, um, you know, the the benefits that have emerged from other communities, um, certainly you know, the physics archive, the biomedical community. And I feel like we need um, first to get something, well, first we need the broad community support. Um, and then we need something, uh, at least initial um, system up and running and then to build a community around it. So I, I kind of see it as um, we see the value of preprints. Um, we notice that it's lacking in our community and want to um, put something in place so that we can promote it and so that other scientists can see the benefits and hopefully um, expand efforts over the next few years. So tell me in terms of your community building, who um, who would you go to? Maybe give me three or four names. Uh, oh, you mean in terms of building the um, a community, community around the preprint? Uh-huh. Um, I, I would go to uh, this ESIP community. Um, I guess I would think the American Geophysical Union. Um, okay. uh, they're actively looking at it, and um, yeah. GSW. Yeah, GSA. Um, uh -huh. I mean, we don't want to limit it to the U.S. as well. So, uh, like EGU and um, of course. a few um, European institutions as well. Yep. Um, on a Bruce. Bruce, do you have any names that come to mind? Yeah, um, I think even uh, some of the in, in, uh, ecological societies uh, that, that deal with large scale. Um, we, we don't want to have it be like a solid, you know, wall. We're not building a wall around the earth sciences. Uh, the earth sciences, you know, and uh, merges into um, population biology at some level and it merges, you know, out into space sciences at some level. So, um, we're, we're not trying to, you know, create that, that boundary condition. We just want to welcome as many people in as, as want to join. And, uh, so what ESA does is it builds governance. Um, so we're going to, so build a governance team that, uh, is inclusive and representative of, uh, you know, both the existing organizations and, uh, non-affiliated scientists that, that need a space to publish their preprints too. Um, we, uh, we, we, we do want to be as agnostic, uh, as, as we can be. So we're not sort of, you know, into labeling it. This is not an ESIP labeled, uh, preprint service. This is just earth sciences. Uh, 